Welcome to Dying in Grace, the program that talks about death and dying with the intention of integrating life and death as part of a natural cycle. We always knew how to take care of each other and we want to relearn what we, we've known from the time we hit the planet. My name is Arlene Steputat and each week I like to invite a community member with a special expertise to talk about some aspect of death and dying. This week, I am delighted to invite my guest, uh, introduce my guest, uh, Rich Block, who is the CEO of the Santa Barbara Zoo. So thank you so much, Rich, oh, for no, being thank here. thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. So, um, Thank you for saying that I'm an, an expert. I'll of course you're an expert. I have to tell my, my team that, that uh, I'm an expert now. Well, yeah, I, I see you as my expert, and, well, and you. I, you know, in full disclosure, I also volunteer at the zoo, so you're also my leader, so all <laughs> those things. Um, so before we talk about um, animals and animal loss at the zoo, I wanted to just first ask you, how did you get involved with a zoo? Well, I, I'm, I'm kind of an accidental zoo director. Uh-huh. Um, beginning in college and kind of after that, I, I did had loads of opportunities to do kind of conservation work, environmental work. And uh, when I was teaching at the University of Michigan, a good friend of mine was working at the Cincinnati Zoo. And I spent a lot of time with him at the zoo and saw the incredible potential for education and conservation, two things I'm very passionate about. And that got me interested in zoos, and then the rest of it was pretty evolutionary. So I just got lucky at, at one point and ended up here in Santa Barbara 21 years ago. So it's wow, been so exciting. It's 21, so two, more than two decades of service to our right, community. Right, and, and, and what a great place to, to work. Oh, yeah. It, it's a gem in our community for sure. So this year in particular, the zoo has experienced loss of some of the most beloved members, animal members of our uh, of our collection. I don't know what the right word is for well, the zoo. Uh, our zoo family. Our zoo our, family, yeah. and um, I, and I wanted to talk to you about um, you know the impact and and, and the first one I, I think the one that uh, people are still working with is is the the death of Susie. Uh -huh. Sujatha, um, our elephant. And so um, for people who don't know, can you tell us a little bit about Sujatha and her companion, Little Mac, and just a little bit how they came to the zoo? Right. So these two female Asian elephants uh, were both born in India. Um, Sujatha was born into a logging camp, and uh, Mac uh, was uh, found kind of ab abandoned. Mm -hmm. and was brought to that camp. Ultimately, they were moved uh, to the Mysore Zoo. Uh, and the Mysore Zoo exchanged those two elephants uh, for California sea lions. Ah. So it was uh, a, an exchange. And so the estimate is that they were born in 1971, and they arrived here in Santa Barbara in 1972. Uh, so up until her, uh, her, her death, Sujatha was a Santa Barbara resident for, for basically almost all of her entire life. And so that would put them at 48 now? Right. 40, four, she died so at 48, 48, so 48 right. years old. Okay. So uh, the, that is the, the medium, median life expectancy for Asian elephants in, in zoos. Mm -hmm. uh, so both of them were, were kind of right there uh, at that median. Uh, but, uh, you know, all animals, just like people, are unique. And mm -hmm. as we age, uh, we all develop uh, different challenges. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, I'm no different. I have some specific physical challenges right. that are just age-related. Right. And so the, the uh, care providers, the keepers are responsible for those animals, uh, actually do everything they can, sometimes going to extraordinary lengths, uh, to try to deal with kind of pain management and, and extended care. Right. Uh, and that's one reason why for many of the animals at the Santa Barbara Zoo, they, they live past what would be kind of average life expectancy. 
Right, so we just, um, another um, beloved friend we lost this year, well, we lost both of our snow leopards, but I believe ever, when Everett passed, he was the, the oldest snow leopard in captivity, the second right. oldest. Yeah, you know? the oldest under human care that we could identify anywhere in the world. Uh, and uh, Zoe was a little younger. Uh -huh. uh, she had passed before he did right. uh, by a couple of months. But even in that case, uh, she was kind of an older uh, cat. Uh, large cats uh, in, in the wild, uh, in their early teens at best, if they make it that long. Uh, in zoo settings where they receive a lot of care, especially where they can get specialized medical care uh, over time, uh, you know, they outlive that, that wildlife expectancy by a significant number of years. As a matter of fact, one of the lions that was here when I arrived, Callie, uh, ended up being over 22 years old when she mm -hmm. finally uh, passed away. And that is like way off the actuarial charts for, for lions. So as we look at an aging collection, it, it's not unreasonable to anticipate that you're going to start losing some of those animals as they age. Fortunately, Chadwick, our, our right. very elderly right. a male lion, uh, kind of hangs in there and responds well to medical treatments and care. Mm -hmm. uh, seems to be quite comfortable. And uh, because of the training programs, we basically work with the animals and, and they do what they want to do. And you know, mm -hmm. we provide opportunities for engagement. And if they want to participate in some training or, or an activity, uh, that's, it's totally up to them to you do know, that. You know, it's not unlike how we deal with our elders. So, you know, I, I am currently still a, a volunteer with hospice and uh -huh. um, I'm currently working with a woman that's 100 years old. And that's, I've worked with a woman that was 107 years old. So, so you know, our lifespan, there's a lot of people that are living a long time. And yet, when this, either one of these women, when they finally pass, it's not going to be any easier on their children and their loved ones. I mean, no. yes, it's a good life and they know it's coming and they can see it. But when that happens, it doesn't make it any easier. You can say, yes, no. they had a good life, but you're still in great pain. Um, and, and, and I think some of the times we say that for ourselves. You know, it's reassuring to say, well, they had a full life. Right. Well, yeah, and, because we, we hurt. And, and, and so that's, that's our response to that, to, to try to uh, balance out some of that personal pain. Now, the relationship between keepers and the animals in the zoo uh, is, is a remarkably close relationship, but it's really different from a pet, Yeah. The, where you have this kind of constant physical uh, inter interaction, my favorite beagle, yeah, slept yeah, on the yeah. bed with us. Right. I cannot think of a zoo animal that I would want sleeping in the bed with me, especially large cats. Oh, I know I have those, cats those fantasies, though. Um, I just went to Australia and was able to hold a koala for a moment, and I know it's not optimal, but I, I could see myself <laughs> taking a koala home with me. So, but, but, you know, the bottom line is, is that the, the, they, they have a, a relationship with these animals and it really is difficult for them to see over time, especially if they're aging, uh, to see them have difficulty with uh, mobility right. or their diet. And because every single day, the keepers are watching these animals closely. They are developing programs to try to encourage natural behaviors and, and keep their lives interesting. Mm -hmm. and, so th this, is, this is a very special relationship. And, and to watch an animal over time just go through this kind of natural aging is still difficult. In the same way that it's difficult to see a parent sure. lose, lose some abilities. Uh, and, and certainly with the animals, the communication is very different from a person where you can see that they're losing cognitive ability right, or right. memory. But, uh, for animals, you, you know, it, 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 keepers are saddened if they're not as responsive to things, if, if they look like uh, th they're not kind of as sharp or are right. kind of on their game, so to speak. 
Uh, so imagine, you know, in the, in the case of uh, the elephants, our lead keeper had over 10 years of experience with the elephants, um, and especially with the elephants, because there the relationship really is, there's a, a tactile component to that as right, well. Right, right. That, that, that's, that, that's uh, it's very difficult to, to, to deal with that. And, and so, I mean, I, I'm, you know, the, 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 if you want to call it a grieving process or, or what people go through with that, um, I still personally have this sense that I'm going to see Susie or Sujatha when I go up to the elephant exhibit. So you get and, surprised. You right, get and, and I have to remind myself that, that, that Mac is there and, and seeing Mac brings no less kind of joy and energy to my experience, but there is a sense of loss that continues sure. when I go there and, and she's not there. Yeah, ha half, half of who we're used to is not there. Right, and, and so, I mean, these are adjustments that people have. I have to keep reminding myself to, to say elephant as opposed to elephants. Right. Uh, and, and you could say, well, that's just, that's just habit, but part of it is, is that I continue to think of our family Mm -hmm. with two elephants. Right. And, and so, I, uh, I, so I let, think... So let me just, um, I, and I don't know all the circumstances, so um, I would imagine there's times when you discover an, a an animal has passed. You, you know, they just die a natural death, if you will, and, you know, you go to the cage and like, oh, there's someone right. who's and, passed. Right, and that was the case with Zoe. Uh-huh, so she just, they just discovered that she died, and there's some peace in that, in a way, I think. There's some shock, but there's some peace, like, oh, okay, she died a natural death. Now, with, with Susie, um, the process of deciding to euthanize, and certainly people who are pet owners can understand the agony about that. And yeah. I know it's done with great care. Can you talk a little bit about the process for all of you and the zookeeper and the vet staff? And Sure, it, and, and, and there, there actually is kind of a quality of life assessment mm -hmm. that they go through. And uh, it, it's something that will start kind of very early in the process. It's not something that you start when things just look terrible. Because what they're doing is they're looking at all aspects of quality of life. And, and that has to do with, you know, her, her diet, her behavior, her physical condition. Uh, if they are uh, treating a, a physical condition, it could be arthritis, right. something that we know causes discomfort. And they can see that in the way an animal moves. So, and you're assessing all the animals in the zoo all the time. I mean, isn't sure, that... Sure, the that, keepers... The keepers, are, are that yeah. part of what they're monitoring of the... Because just because uh, an animal isn't older doesn't mean they might not have some health challenge. Right. Just like humans. Right. So, so every single day, and, and, and I don't mean like for the hissing cockroaches, although uh -huh. they will write kind of a general like assessment. Like what's going on, yeah. But for... for, for Kind of those significant animals, mm -hmm. uh, meaning that you know they're large enough to, to be able to have kind of an identity. Uh -huh. So everything from all of the birds to uh, the armadillos, which you know are pretty compact, yep. uh, to the frogs and the lizards, uh, they all get individual reports. So every single day, keepers take time uh, to re write reports on these animals, and all of that goes into this huge database mm -hmm. and and what that does is give them the ability to go back and and look at changes in behavior uh, anything that may relate to changes in health so that they'll know if they're off their diet mm -hmm. they'll know if there's a behavior that's developing that they can pay more attention to and in terms of mobility they can note whether you know if an animal is favoring uh, a leg, a wing, right, right. whatever it might be, and, and this is in their notes. And then when they work with the veterinary staff, there's going to be a whole other layer of information about that animal that, that talks about kind of their physical, physical condition. And then every year, just like people, should be going in to, to get an to annual get, exam. Exactly, and so we do that with the animals as well. And uh, there's a, a huge investment in, mm -hmm. in care. 
So you can imagine after that huge investment and everything else to, to lose an animal. Or uh, decide that you must. Right. That so like in it's, Susie's it's case, and, and I know Susie was, you know, declining to a degree, but then, you know, the decision to euthanize. And can you talk about that, that process of, of the decision and then, you know, what happened, like what happened to her? I think people don't understand how the zoo um, uses the animals that die to help with research, et cetera. Sure. So if you can just help us understand what happens, because people don't understand all of the complexities of what happens. Right. So, so in, 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 in Sujatha's case specifically, uh, her, her health was being very closely monitored right. over a period of more than a year, actually probably about two to two and a half years. And that's when they started to really notice uh, declines. Mm -hmm. So just like people, you have good days and bad days. And so there, there will be these little kind of hiccups along the way. And while those are noted, they, they don't become this major focus of concern. It just, it kind of happens, it's noted, right. and, and things get back to some normal. Right. Uh, in this case, though, there, there was uh, deterioration that they could note and became measurable over time. And, you know, I, and it was kind of what I went through. I, I, I had this uh, just absolute favorite beagle that, that I loved to pieces. And there, there is a point where you worry that you waited too long. Right. That, you don't want to have suffering. Right. That, that, that they suffered longer than they needed to for us. Right, because we couldn't make and, the decision. Right, and, and, and so in the case of my beagle, that's, that's actually what, what kind of pushed me to realize that I really had waited too long. Uh -huh. and, and, that, and that made it even worse. Sure. Because now I felt... Guilty. Yeah, I felt guilty, I felt terrible. So it, the decisions with the animals at the zoo are, are, no, more, are no less difficult than right. that. And we, we do have to step back and, and it really is um, a, a group assessment. So it's the keepers that are providing this daily care. It's a veterinary staff that knows medical conditions and prospects for treatment and right. recovery. Right. And all of those things are factored together to, to try to decide at what point are, are, have we moved into an area where re, we really can't provide any pain relief, we can't manage pain, we can't provide a path forward for treatment. It's time for and, hospice. And yeah, and then so you're, you're kind of in that, in that position where you realize you are out of options. Right. And, and that's a, a really difficult point to, to kind of arrive at. And so even once you're kind of there, there is, you know, this, this kind of hesitation, partly because of people's attachment to these animals. Well, certainly those two were such a community draw. I, oh. I mean, it's, it's kind of like when Jemina died, too, you know, with the elephant, uh, the elephant, the giraffe with the crooked right. neck that had a book written about her. I mean, there, and... Um, you know, and I know just as a penguin docent, all the questions I get every time about where's Lucky, how's he doing, you know, so sure. there's these um, personalities and favorite beloved things, especially with, you know, the elephants, people, they're generational. People remember when they were kids and now they're taking Absolutely. their kids. So there's this deep community attachment. Right. You yeah, long-lived so, animals. That, that, that is a connection that gets developed between the community and the animals, but also uh, for keepers yes. that have a long-term long engagement with, with those particular animals. So gorillas in particular, there's, yeah. there's a, a closeness. Um, well, there's a love. I mean, let's, let, I, I mean, I know the relationship is that, they, but, but they, I can't believe that people don't, the keepers are there because they love animals and they love their animals. Uh, that's my, I mean, the care, the oh, devotion, it's, it's, it's love. And so when we love and we have to say goodbye to those we love, it doesn't matter whether you have fur, feathers, or skin. It's hard. Sure. And in many cases, 
uh, we reach out and communicate with those people that historically had a relationship with these animals to let them know right. as well. So it's not like they kind of go away and people that knew them before are kind of out of the equation. The fact is that that entire group uh, associated with the care of those animals is, is brought uh, together and, and informed. And uh, you have some that. signage at the zoo that explains a little bit about where Little Mac is now. Or, and right. and I, I know I, I visited zoos. There's a zoo in, I think it was Phoenix, that had an, a, a lion and kind of did an obituary and uh -huh. a memorial with the picture of the lion and the years and who that lion was as a way to acknowledge to people that how come the cage only has one where right. so and so you know that kind of thing right so, so jimena actually has a large brass uh interpretive uh, plaque that's mounted up over the giraffe exhibit and her and uh, the replica of her um, skeleton is in the discovery pavilion too right and and part of that is just the natural curiosity right. about an animal that lived with what people would think might be a debilitating uh deformity or feature, uh, actually lived a, a very full, fairly normal giraffe life. The one thing she could do is look around corners better than <laughs> other giraffes. But the, 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 the reality is, is that she was a great role model for anyone that's, that's kind of dealing with some kind of a, a challenge, physical challenge, to, to realize that you know what? You you can you can survive. You, you can, you can make it work. You can look a little different from Perfect. everybody else, but still have a normal life, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And as a matter of fact, that's why she'd been on a number of television shows uh -huh. over the years that made that point, but also just kind of the uniqueness that there aren't a lot of giraffes with that right angle, right, uh, it, 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 in their neck. So, uh, I, w I would say probably of all of our animals, she was the most notable, best known. Right, right. And years ago when the news press did a uh, special feature on the personalities of Santa Barbara. And she was all one the of them? She was, one, she was the only animal in the well, personalities amongst movie stars and musicians and, and other people. But she people. was a celebrity. And, oh, and, absolutely. And, and I think, uh, you know, so, so with the passing of, of Susie and... Um, I know that people are still really concerned. I know people still ask. So there's grieving going on still in the community, a discovery like where's the other elephant and what happened. Yeah. And um, the question people ask a lot is, um, do, is, is um, Little Mac grieving? You know, and so the question is, you know, we don't like to anthropomorphize our right. animals, but I know that when Susie died, you let Mac hang out with her for a while. We did, and as a matter of fact, we had planned that into the process. Uh, we didn't have uh, kind of a time set right. that, you know, okay, your five minutes are up. Um, it really was totally for her to tell us because there are lots of examples, especially in elephants, of the behavior of elephants over a member of a herd yes. that's died and the behavior of the rest of the herd or an individual over time. So it, it's, we, we know that there's a process going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't want to inject what I think that process right. is, but we know something's going on there. And so we did allow for that. And um, we actually moved um, Susie's body to a portion of the yard where Mac would have easier access. And she was in the barn at that point, and we opened the, the doors up, and she came out and literally just walked right past Susie and went to a corner of the yard and was there for a couple of minutes and then literally walked right back into the barn. And so we just waited, and uh, a short time later she came back out, and this time uh, with her trunk just kind of acknowledged that Susie was there and, and checked her feet. Mm -hmm. and then went back to the other corner of the yard. And, and so there was never a point at which she spent an extended amount of time right. kind of with Susie, but just over a, a period of well over an hour, 
she would just kind of pay a little bit of attention and then move on like and that. come back. Uh, and then there was a point at which she just basically went back in the barn and didn't come back out, mm. uh, which is the, the point at which the, the team decided that, that they could move on. Um, so um, I, I want to just spend a little bit of time because we're getting close um, to talk about the other side and that is some of the new the new zoo uh, animals that have come in. So we recently got capybaras and I mean right. as we look at the cycle we have some young. We've had baby otters, we've had baby giraffes. Right. So we really the zoo does. Baby anteaters. We've yeah, done really twins, well with anteaters. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I think it's just as it's just really important for all of us to acknowledge the life cycle that is at the zoo and and the emotions that we all have as community members, as zookeepers, as just people who love animals. Right. That um, our grief and our missing and our sadness is all part of all of that. You know. Right. And um, you know, if you if you haven't been at the Santa Barbara Zoo, please. Uh, go visit, go see our latest animals, the capybaras, and just um, enjoy the gifts of the zoo. Um, Rich, I, I just can't thank you enough for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Indeed. And um, one of the things that we do um, when we do this program is we invite people to um, put the name of someone that they uh, have lost, whether it's an animal or a human, um, in this book of Living Love. And it says, to live in hearts we leave behind is not to die. So uh, animal or human, if there's someone you'd like to add to our, um, our book of Living Love, I'm going to Can, gonna can I add you. more than one? You can put in as many as you want. And while you're doing that, I want to thank my crew. Here, you can find I'll, that. I'll do that. I'd like to thank my crew, Elliot Jacobson, Michael Nicholson, TVSB, for allowing us to do this show. And thank you to our viewers. Uh, you can see past episodes on dyingingrace.com.